Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we will get started in just a minute. I just want to make sure everybody has time to join into our um, Zoom here. So we will get started in just a couple minutes. All right, welcome and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Alexis. I am a librarian here at the Hudson Library and I'm very excited to introduce tonight's author, Dr. Dawn Harris Sherling, who is here to discuss her book, Eat Everything, How to Ditch Additives, Heal Your Body, and Reclaim the Joy of Food. Um, Eat Everything reveals the groundbreaking truth behind the common additives and emulsifiers in our food and the damage they are causing to our health. Copies of the book are available for purchase at Hudson's Independent Bookstore, The Learned Owl, um, and I'll be putting a link in the chat to purchase the book on their website if that's something you're interested in. Um, as always with our virtual programs, uh, there will be time tonight for a Q&A with Dr. Dawn, um, so please feel free to submit your questions throughout the duration of the program using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And now to introduce Dawn to you all. Um, Dawn Sherling is an internal medicine physician. She currently sees patients at a clinic for underserved populations and is an associate program director for the internal medicine residency at the Charles E. Schmidt College of Medicine at Florida Atlantic University. So with that, I will let uh, pass things over to Dawn to get things started for tonight. Great, well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk about this book and my journey. Um, and I guess I'll just start off by, by telling you how I got here, um, which is I was minding my own business, uh, not thinking of writing a book. And then um, I went to Italy. I got to go with my family on a trip to Italy, which was amazing. And before that, I had been suffering with the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. And I thought, okay, well, I'm in my 30s. I had kids. Uh, and this is just what I have to deal with now. And like 15% of the U.S. population struggles with irritable bowel. And I'm like, well, now I'm one of them. And I told myself to do the things that I would tell patients to do. So get rid of dairy, maybe get rid of the gluten, try the low FODMAP diet. And it's everything my patient said was true. Like, this is really hard. It doesn't work that well. And, and that was true for me as well. And then I go to Italy and I'm fine and everything is great. And it's like, whoa, what, what happened? How did, how did this happen? Right. I thought I was going to go to Italy and eat pasta and pizza and gelato and be miserable from like a gut perspective. Right. Because you're not supposed to have that stuff if you have irritable bowel, but I was, I was great. I started off slowly. I'd steal little bits of my kids stuff. Um, and, and I felt normal and great and wonderful. And I thought, well, what's going on here? And when I got back to the US, I said, okay, I'm going to do a deep dive. Um, I'm a little bit of an obsessive. I'm going to do a deep dive into the published literature in medical journals and see what's going on with the food here versus the food there. And I started encountering all these studies, which have been coming out since around 2015, 2016, basically showing that a lot of the additives that we're using in our food that aren't used in, in as great a quantity in other places like Italy um, are absolutely disruptive to our systems. So I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about that. I, um, I started first, you know, trying, trying it out myself. I got rid of all the emulsifiers and other additives for which there was evidence that it causes kinds of problems. And then I suggested to my patients, they do it and it, it worked. And I said, okay, well now I have to tell more people. So I'm going to write a book. Um, so that's great. So I've gotten to do that. And, um, I've gotten to hear from people that, that it's really helped them out in terms of not only GI stuff, but diabetes and weight loss and all kinds of other things that people struggle with. Um, and it's, it's 
called eat everything because we can eat everything as long as it's whole foods, real foods. We actually can eat everything, which is how we were eating, how humanity has been eating for millennia and has only recently in the last 70 years or so changed. So this um, got me into it. This got me writing the book and more and more evidence since I started writing the book has been coming out. And in 2022, I think there was a study published showing that for the first time in a hundred years, life expectancy in the U.S. is actually going down, is decreasing. And that happened across the world because of COVID, and, and we know that. But other um, economically similar countries have actually seen their um, life expectancies go back, increase again, and ours continues to decline. So there are lots of reasons for that, right? It's not all diet. There's an opioid epidemic in this country. There's a gun epidemic in this country. There are all kinds of reasons why we're falling behind other economically similar countries, but ultra processed food for sure is a major part of that. And so the idea that ultra processed food could be doing this is something that's faced a lot of pushback, right? So there've been studies that have come out and there are headlines like every week, every month, we see headlines like don't eat ultra processed food. A few months ago, the World Health Organization said, stop eating fake sugars, stop having sugar substitutes. And I think a lot of us probably saw that. And then, you know, folks came out and they said, no, 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 it's, it's actually not that bad. It's okay, right? Like we can keep doing this. And so a study will come out and say, mm, maybe we shouldn't do this. And then there's a huge pushback. And, and the, the, the thing that kind of gets out there is, oh, it's probably fine. And the thing is, as the evidence is building, it's it's kind of not. And for the longest time, and I think we still do this, we talk about carbs and protein and fat and macros. And you'll have somebody come out and say, well, you know, eat low carb, eat super low carb, eat, you know, low fat, eat more protein, eat, do this, do that, whatever it is. And we're getting more unhealthy and we're getting heavier as a country, which in and of itself, you know, isn't a bad thing, but is associated with a lot of diseases. So it's a risk factor for a lot of diseases. And so these are things that we kind of have to start facing. Um, and, and the thing is, even physicians, I gave a talk this weekend, and even physicians don't know what a healthy diet is. So when we say eat a healthy diet, right, physicians know to say, okay, stop smoking, cut back on alcohol, move more. These are all things like, I think we know, but when we say eat a healthy diet, it's like, okay, let's do that. But what does that actually mean? And so what was interesting is that recently US News and World Report, you know, they have rankings for colleges and institutions of higher learning and all of that. They actually have a ranking on diets. And I looked at it and it looks like there are some diets that are great, that are seen to be super healthy, that promote health, that have good evidence that they promote health. And those diets have something in common. And those things are avoiding the ultra processed foods and eating whole foods. I mean, when you look at things like the Mediterranean diet, we've all heard of the Mediterranean diet, I think in some capacity. Um, when we look at things like the DASH diet, which is a diet to lower blood pressure, those were rated one and two. Um, mind diet, other types of, of ways of eating. I hate the word diet, right? But other ways of eating, the emphasis is on whole foods and cutting out the ultra processed stuff. And so that's something that we're seeing more and more and more in the data, but we're not talking about enough. And so why? Why is it that the whole foods aren't being talked about enough? And there's a concept called nutritional reductionism, where we are talking about the components of the food rather than the whole food. And what we need to start doing is recognizing that the whole food has a huge impact. It's not just about what um, where the food came from. So if you look at a package and you know it's, it's a cereal, it's a super highly processed cereal, and one of the ingredients is apple, that's not the same thing as eating an apple. And you would say, well, you know, it may have the same vitamins. And it says it has fiber in it and the apple has fiber. So why isn't it the same? And the idea is there are these organisms in our gut called our microbiome, which 
are bacteria and um, fungus and uh, viruses and all kinds of other organisms that live in there. And what we know is nature abhors a vacuum. So when we eat things that we can't digest, like fibers that are in a lot of healthy food, but fiber that's also used as an additive, a lot of the additives are fibers, which are basically just long chain carbohydrates that we can't digest. And it used to be thought, okay, we're gonna eat these fibers and they're just gonna pass through us. It's just meant to bulk up our poop and pass through us. And that's not true. Our microbiome will use the fiber for energy. And when we eat a whole apple, the apple is within the, the fibers are within the food matrix. The sugars, the other molecules are within the food matrix and they pass through us. And it's a digestive process that happens so that those things are not available to the microbiome until later on in the digestive tract. If we eat the fibers in ultra processed food, even in processed food, it gets digested earlier. And so we're feeding different microorganisms in different places in our guts. So there are lots of diseases that um, can be impacted by what our gut microbiome looks like. And we're learning more and more that uh, a maladaptive, a dysbiotic microbiome is associated with certain types of cancer, with colon cancer, maybe even with breast cancer. They're looking at other cancers where younger and younger people are being impacted. And so it turns out the types of fibers we eat and where they feed our microbiome affects the health of our gut and even beyond. Because when those organisms digest those fibers, they produce something called short chain fatty acids. And those short chain fatty acids act as signaling molecules. And they affect our mental health and all kinds of biological processes. Beyond that, when um, the microbiome isn't the way it should be, what can happen is the mucus layer of our guts gets broken down and that can affect inflammation in our bodies, that can lead to fatty liver. So there are all kinds of things going on and it turns out how we're nourishing our gut is super, super important. So how we think about food has to change. It's not just about the components, it's how those components are packaged within the food and um, how we're eating them with other foods as well. So instead of thinking about it in sort of this very reductionist kind of way, we have to start thinking about it in a holistic kind of way. And there's a researcher who I got to interview for my book who goes by, whose um, name is Carlos Montero. He's a physician scientist at the University of Sao Paulo. And he and his team developed uh, something called the NOVA food classification system. And what's really cool about the NOVA food classification system is it looks at food in a whole new way. So they have group one foods, category one foods, and those foods are whole foods. So what's a whole food? A whole food is an apple, a banana. Um, if you're a meat eater, a piece of fish, a piece of chicken, how it looks like when it comes out of the ground or comes from the organism, very minimally processed, right? Category two foods are salt, sugar, butter, oil. They're not bad. They're used to prepare category one foods. They shouldn't be used in humongous amounts, right? Like I'm not saying go out there and go deep fry something. You know, occasionally, yeah, if you enjoy that and celebratory, whatever, go deep fry something. Don't do that every day, right? Um, don't eat a ton of sugar. The WHO said don't have um, a lot of sugar substitutes, but they also said don't eat a lot of sugar, right? So it's it's like, it's not like you can put one in for the other. It's not like they said, oh, don't eat sugar substitutes. So now I'm going to eat a ton of sugar. Oh, wait, okay, don't eat sugar. I'm going to eat a ton of sugar substitutes. Like, mm, we're not supposed to be doing that. Okay, so that's category two. Category three are traditionally processed foods. So it's stuff to think of as, um, you know, you have wheat that's turned into flour, that's turned into bread, that's processed. But it's not bad if it's traditionally processed. So Dr. Montero's team says, don't make it more than 20, 25% of your diet, right? We can't just eat bread and cheese all day. I, I would like to do that also, but um, can't. So, okay, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna have, um, you know, that make up some of our diet, not all of our diet. Category four foods are the ultra processed foods. And what those foods are basically is stuff that our bodies aren't accustomed to. It's, these are novel ingredients that have been developed 
without regard to what they do to our microbiome. So when these additives and emulsifiers were developed, um, there was thinking like, okay, yeah, we got to test these things, right? People say, well, the FDA approved it. It must be okay. And yes, the FDA approved it and other organizations approved these substances, um, but they were approved based on really short studies. No one looked at what they did in the long term. Nobody even knew about the microbiome. So they were never tested against the microbiome. And so we now know from group, there's a research group in France, Benoit Chessing, who I got to interview for the book as well, is doing research basically looking at um, what different emulsifiers, other components that are going into these ultra processed foods do to the microbiome, how they change the microbiome. And so uh, that's been like eye-opening in terms of what some of these emulsifiers do. Some of the bad actors, carrageenan, um, maltodextrin is not technically an emulsifier, but is a pretty bad actor, polysorbate. And these are things in ice cream and dairy alternatives. So we think about, you know, oh, I'm gonna have some almond milk or some coconut milk, and that's gonna be way better. Um, but it turns out, it's, it's not actually when they have all of those emulsifiers and things in it. Yes, you can get those things without the emulsifiers in it. And so I tell my patients, don't look at the front of the package, look at the back of the package, look at the ingredients and really see what's in there. Um, and so that really makes a huge difference because right now our diet is 60% ultra processed food. And for our kids, it might even be as high as 70% ultra processed foods. And that's making a huge difference. We've seen rates of diabetes basically quadruple in the last four decades. We are seeing colon cancer now in people in their 30s and 40s, which we never saw before. And so there really is a link between these things. And more and more studies are coming out showing that. And as other countries increase their consumption of ultra processed food, we're seeing rates of these diseases increase in those countries as well. So it's, you know, really important, but beyond the, the diseases that we're talking about, you know, these drugs, Ozempic and Wagovi have been making the headlines and people are, are so excited, right? They're like, oh, finally something to help lose weight. And they work for a lot of people and they do lead to weight loss. Now, long-term, we don't have data yet. So we're all engaged in a, in a huge experiment <laughs> right now with these things. But what we know is that the ultra processed food also makes us gain weight and eating whole foods helps us to lose weight. So there was a study done. Um, it's really hard to do these nutrition studies, but there was a study done at the National Institutes of Health here a few years ago by a scientist by the name of Kevin Hall. And Dr. Hall went and he took a group of participants and he put them on an ultra processed diet for two weeks and he housed them at the NIH. So he watched everything about them. He watched how much they were sleeping and how much they were exercising and absolutely everything you can measure, they measured in these people. And it turned out two weeks on the mostly ultra processed diet caused them to gain two pounds in two weeks. Then he took those same people and switched them to an on mostly unprocessed diet, mostly those Nova group one foods, and they lost two pounds in two weeks, just doing that, which is amazing. They didn't change anything else. They were doing the same amount of physical activity, sleeping the same, everything else was the same. And so the only thing they had done was change um, the type of food they were eating. And people say, oh, well, that's because the ultra processed stuff tastes so good. So we're just going to eat a bunch of it. And that's not necessarily the case because Dr. Hall had them rate um, the palatability of the food. And it turns out that people in that study rated the palatability equally. So the ultra processed meals and the whole food meals were equally palatable. So that is something that is, is incredible. And I'm shocked that we're not talking about that more when we give people, you know, advice on, on what they should or, or shouldn't be eating. He also did a follow-up study actually looking at um, a higher fat versus a um, higher carbohydrate diet. And people lost weight on both of those 
when it was a whole foods based diet. So that's something that, you know, it should make us pause and say, well, what kind of advice are we giving people? Right. And, and when we look at all these diet gurus and all these people out there, you know, what are, what are they telling us? Um, and so what should we do? Right. Um, and some countries are actually moving in, in a good direction. So Brazil, I mentioned Dr. Montero's group, they've come up with uh, dietary guidelines as a guide. They don't have a pyramid. They don't have a plate. They basically say, I'm going to give you some tips to make your diet more whole food based because we know that that's what we should do. So they said, okay, you know, have those traditionally processed foods, not more than 20 or 25% of the diet and avoid the ultra processed foods, right? And I say avoid the ones particularly with emulsifiers in them because those have been shown to disrupt the microbiome the most. Um, but the Brazilians also say food should be joyful. Food should be a celebration. And a lot of other cultures say that too. I don't think we say that enough. Um, it's like, oh, all doom and gloom and, and I don't want it to be that way, right? So, so yes, like let's make it happy. And the Brazilian guidelines actually say we should make eating something we do with friends and family. And, you know, a joyful experience. We should learn how to cook from people who know how to cook because that's a dying art, right? And, and the best thing I've ever, I've ever gotten is when, you know, somebody's mom or grandma has shown me how to make something. And it's like such a gift, right? Because those recipes are going to, are going to leave us if we don't, if we don't capture them now. Um, and so the other thing that the Brazilians say is we should, this is something we're never going to hear in this country, right? Like our politicians and, and people who make the guidelines are never going to say this, but be wary of food marketing. So the Brazilian guidelines actually tell people, don't listen to food marketing, right? They're, they're not, they don't have your best interest at heart. Um, look at the ingredients. And if it's something you can't picture in your mind's eye when you're looking at the ingredients, think about putting it back. You know, or if you're at the grocery store and you have your phone, Google, right? Look at um, look at what those things are. And we can't really assume that these things are healthy for us or good for us because the front of the package says natural or, you know, handmade or whatever those other things that are on there say, because those are marketing terms. And if, if we're, if we're wary of the marketing and we're saying, okay, we're not going to pay attention to the front of the package. We're going to turn around, we're going to look at the back of the package, and we're going to try to get things that are really good for us, right? So I think that's how we reclaim our health, and that has made a big difference in my life, and I will acknowledge it is a huge privilege to be able to have the time and the money and the resources. So in Kevin Hall's study that I talked about, they spent 30% more when the patients were on the whole food diet, when the participants were in the whole food diet. So it can be done a little bit more cheaply. I know you mentioned that I take care of patients that are underserved, uninsured. A lot of them are um, recent immigrants to this country and they do not have a lot of money. Um, and they're able to get really creative, which is hard. Especially though, if they come from countries where eating whole foods was a tradition, then they understand immediately and they know immediately. I think it's harder when the younger generation is coming because wherever you come from in the world now, you're probably eating ultra processed foods. Um, so when younger folks are coming over, it's harder because they don't, they don't necessarily know. And people who grew up in this country and our parents' generation and even our grandparents' generation are so used to ultra processed food that it's something to just build on day by day. It's not gonna happen all at once. Um, it, it does take more time. Uh, it does usually take a bit more money. And so it is a privilege to be able to do it. We, if we can do it though, I think it's something that we really need to strive for because it's really, it's getting, um, it's getting challenging out there in terms of how, how many diseases are actually increasing in prevalence as opposed to decreasing in prevalence. And so it's really, it's time to, to do whatever we can on the policy level. If we can advocate for change, that's great. Um, if we can't in our own homes, when we go to the supermarket, find one or two things you can swap out every time you go and, and just, you know, day by day, try to, try to make a change. 
Thank you so much, John. There's a lot of good information that you shared. So thank you very much. Um, we will kind of start to transition into our Q&A portion of tonight's program. Um, but I was wondering, as I was reading your book and as you were speaking, I, I was thinking about how, how we're sort of inundated with all of these almost rules, like you should eat this or you shouldn't eat that or this new diet is really great and everybody should be doing this and following these guidelines. Do you have any recommendations for people on just how to kind of filter through and figure out what is worth listening to and what's not? I think it's really hard. There was an article in the Washington Post that came out recently looking at um, influencers on on Instagram and other social media platforms that are dietitians, that are registered dietitians. And they're basically um, sponsored by these ultra processed food companies. So it can be really hard to see, okay, well, where are these legitimate messages coming from? And where is it stuff that's that's being sold to us by the ultra processed food industry? And so basic principles, right? If it if it's something that, you know, is is a whole food, something that you prepare yourself, it's great. It's great. Unless your doctor has told you specifically to avoid certain foods, right? There are people who are lactose intolerant. There are people who have celiac disease and can't have um, wheat-based products. So no, they can't eat everything. But if you haven't been told, you know, that you suffer from some condition where you specifically can't eat a certain food item, then if you're able to get a whole food, great. If you're not, and you know, look, I have kids, I work, sometimes we're gonna eat processed food. Sometimes my kids are getting boxed macaroni and cheese, okay? Like, let's be real, let's be honest, that's what's happening. But I try to minimize, minimize those times. And I look at the ingredient list and I'll compare, okay, you know, and yes, I have the privilege to be able to spend a dollar more on the box of mac and cheese. So I can buy the one with fewer ingredients that, you know, I can't picture in my mind's eye. So if you can buy the processed food or even the ultra processed food with, you know, without those emulsifiers in my book, I list 25 of them that have the most robust evidence to date, some of the additives and emulsifiers um, to avoid. And there are apps, there are apps out there that you can plug those into and they can scan the package um, and you can avoid them. But in general, um, if someone's asking you to buy something, a specific supplement, a specific protein powder, a specific whatever, that's, I wouldn't listen to that advice. If someone's telling you to eat a banana, eat an apple, you know, have something that is, is um, closer to the earth and more natural, that's probably someone whose advice you can listen to. All right, so we've got some questions coming in now. Um, somebody was wondering about GMOs and they've noticed that a lot of brands kind of have either GMO ingredients or mentioned that they have no GMOs. So they were wondering um, if you could share your opinion about that. So GMOs are um, genetically modified, uh, basically food substances. And there's been a lot of back and forth on GMOs. And so the idea is that the food is changed in a lab, sometimes to make it more resistant to pesticides and herbicides. Um, so Roundup is the big one that gets talked about. Uh, and so, so grains have been modified specifically, Monsanto is that company um, that gets named a lot and for probably good reason. Um, so they come up with a, a grain that is resistant to Roundup and then sell that grain. And that actually um, is not great. <laughs> so having those things out there is, is not great for multiple, um, all kinds of reasons. Um, so yes, it'd be great to be able to, to buy things that are GMO free. Again, it's a cost issue. Uh, is it the most important thing to do? And should you, should you, you know, not be able to afford to keep your lights on to avoid GMOs? No, I don't think so. Um, should there be policies to, to not allow stuff like that in our food supply? Probably. Um, because, you know, again, it's, it's not super well tested. And again, you know, the hard part is these things get, get confounded because people will say, well, 
when we hybridize, you know, which they've been doing in farming for years and making robust crops, that's genetically modifying the, the, the plant. And that's true. And so the problem is that we kind of then lump everything together and we say, we get all confused. It's like, well, yeah, that kind of genetic modification is okay, but the Monsanto stuff that makes the plant resistant to Roundup um, may not be okay. And it's okay actually to say that, right? It's okay to say traditional hybridizing farming methods, we know those have worked for hundreds of years. So yeah, that is genetically modifying, right? Um, and just because it happens in a lab doesn't make it bad, but the fact that we haven't really thoroughly vetted this and thoroughly tested it, that's what makes it bad. Um, we also have some questions from people wondering um, what is kind of a daily diet following um, the guidelines that you recommend in your book. So, you know, what are some ideas for breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, following those? Okay, so it's truly um, so personal, right? Diet is so personal and and depending on what your cultural background is and your budget and everything else, super personal. But I can tell you um, some ideas, uh, which is if you're if you like eggs, eggs are a whole food. Um, nuts are a whole food. Um, there's a recipe in my book that I, but there are a million recipes too. Like I'm not gonna say my book has the exclusive recipe for granola. Um, granola, I think is a great option in the morning paired with yogurt. Um, you know, and heavy on nuts, if that's something that you like, because that'll kind of keep you full. Um, if you can stay away from cereals and yeah, we have cereal boxes in my house too. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't want to act like, oh, it's terrible. Um, but if you can have less cereal and more whole foods, right. So in the morning, which is a meal that mostly we can control, it gets harder when we're out of the house and at work and our kids are at school and so lunches get harder, dinner might get complicated, but breakfast, keep some yogurt, Greek yogurt with just milk and the yogurt cultures. Um, if you like to make granola, it's super easy. Um, you know, make some granola or you can even just have some fruit and nuts and throw that in the yogurt and call it breakfast. And that's another great option. So it's what you like, but think about, you know, if you can do more whole foods. Um, for breakfast. For lunch, I love leftovers. So like the easiest thing in the world to me, I try to cook um, three times a week and then make a big batch and try to have leftovers for the next night, but even enough for me to take to work the next day for lunch. So that's like a big thing because then I'm kind of in control of that. Um, whereas if I'm just reliant on whatever's at work, you know, who knows what's going to be there. So that makes it kind of challenging. So I do like to, to pack leftovers if I can. If I can't, um, you know, you can pack all kinds of, of sandwiches, which can work if you're buying that bread that's not um, ultra processed. And if you look in the freezer section, you can usually get bread that's not ultra processed. Yes, it's more expensive. Um, but, you know, getting a nut butter that again, is just the nut um, and nothing else, maybe a little salt, fine. You know, jellies, jams that are as close to the whole fruit as you can. You can do the peanut butter and jelly thing, which is super easy um, and convenient. And then dinners, I love my slow cooker. Like that is, you know, the, the best because you can throw stuff in in the morning and then boom, when you get home, there's dinner at night and it's like a huge pot. And that's definitely good for two or three meals. Um, somebody was wondering if you could mention uh, some of the emulsifiers that we should be avoiding. So the biggest um, ones out there that have the most uh, data that say that they are, they're really disruptive. Um, something called cellulose gum or carboxymethyl cellulose is a big one. Carrageenan is a really big one. It's extremely pro-inflammatory. In fact, I write in my book about how my husband, when he was doing lab research in med school, um, they actually used carrageenan to induce inflammation in mice. So they could then do whatever they were doing to cure the inf inflammation in the mice. But it's literally something that scientists use to induce inflammation. And it's in a lot of dairy actually and dairy alternatives. So 
carbimethyl, car, carboxymethyl cellulose, CMC or cellulose gum, um, carrageenan is a big one. Another big one that is not technically a emulsifier, but it's in a lot of stuff, maltodextrin has been associated with a lot of metabolic diseases, has been associated with fatty liver. Um, so that's when I would avoid polysorbate, polysorbate 60, polysorbate 80, whatever, um, has been shown to cause a lot of disruption and a lot of changes in gut. And I'll give you one more, which is um, anything that says gum. So xanthan gum, I mentioned cellulose gum, guar gum, those things um, can can be really disruptive as well. So I would I would try to avoid those. And I think if you're avoiding those, oh, can I do one more? Okay, mono and diglycerides. That's another one that seems to be, um, there's more and more evidence coming out that probably mono and diglycerides are, are pretty disruptive. So I would I would avoid those as well. If you're avoiding those big, big six, um, you're probably doing a whole lot of good for yourself. Um, along those lines, uh, somebody has the observation that they've noticed other countries have banned certain foods or certain additives in foods, and they were wondering why the FDA is not as open to doing that, is not as um, transparent in, you know, banning these foods, you know, why they're still here in our country when other countries have decided not to allow them anymore. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I can speculate, right? So I don't work in government. Um, I've never worked in government. So, but from what I hear, um, the FDA is woefully underfunded. So even though there are probably a lot of good scientists there who want to do a lot of good, they they are just really poorly funded. And they actually do rely on industry for a lot of the science. And so I think that's part of it. I mean, if we're being honest, the ultra processed food industry is a multi-billion trillion dollar industry globally and they have huge reach and so when i talked to dr montero in brazil i mean look he was able to rewrite his country's dietary guidelines that's amazing but he says even there it's a david and goliath fight so they are constantly trying to he was telling me that the food advertising to young kids which now has become so commonplace here that i don't even think we realize it but you know they were trying to fight it there. Like they wanted it to make it illegal to market to young kids, which by the way, it was in this country for a time that you couldn't um, put certain ads for certain things for on kids' TV shows. And that's not the case anymore. I don't know what's going on in Europe, if it's allowed or not allowed. Um, but yeah, I mean, industry has a lot more influence here than it does in Europe, but it still has a ton of influence everywhere. Um, somebody, on the topic of children, somebody said that um, they were wondering if you knew if schools or daycare centers kind of follow this, um, you no know, additives or emulsifiers suggestion um, while the kids are in school. Oh, definitely not. So I have uh, two kids in high school now, and you know, I can tell you the food is is bad. And it's been bad. When I was in medical school, I got to rotate on a pediatric endocrinology service. And this was, gosh, 25 years ago. And we were seeing kids with diabetes, young kids with diabetes. And back then, and now those rates have just climbed and climbed and climbed. And the kids would bring in their school lunch menu. Um, and this was, this was up in Connecticut. So now I'm down in Florida. So I know it's in both places. Um, and the kids would bring in their school lunch menu to go over with the dietitian and the endocrinologist. And it was just awful stuff, right? Corn dogs, <laughs> pizza, you know, all these, all these things that, that are definitely ultra processed. Like no one's hand making pizza in the, in the elementary school. Um, and I see it with my own kids and it's, it's not great. You know, my son, even in colleges, my son's applying to college this year. And so we went on all these different tours and um, the amount of ultra processed food on the campuses is just is unreal. So, so no, we're in, we're in big trouble there. <laughs> um, somebody made the observation that soy seems to be something that's in a lot of foods and they were wondering if that's an additive. Yeah. So, so soy, soy is great, right? So if we're having tofu or edamame or all the, 
those are, those are great foods, right? Those are wonderful sources of protein. Um, but if you're finding soy on a uh, spray oil, it says contain soy, something is going wrong, right? Cause there's not supposed to be soy in there. So yeah. So soy lecithin is something that is, is used as an emulsifier and is in a lot of, a lot of products. And even if it's not soy, they use now it, to avoid having to say that it contains soy, they, they use sunflower lecithin. It's the same stuff. And that stuff in large quantities actually causes diarrhea and gastrointestinal distress. It may not be as bad as some of the other additives that I mentioned in terms of um, changing our microbiome to a more inflammatory kind of pro-inflammatory state. Um, but if you see it, it's a signifier of an ultra processed food, right? Unless it's tofu or soy sauce or somewhere that soy is supposed to be. If you see contained soy and because it's an allergen, because a lot of people are allergic to it, they often have to put it in bold on the package. So, you know, if you're in your forties or later, like I am and have a hard time reading those ingredient lists, um, if you just see contained soy and it's not a soy based product, that's an ultra processed food. Um, somebody was wondering if there's any difference when you're talking about these whole foods, um, if you choose organic, is that, is there any difference beyond taste, um, with those foods? Yeah. So maybe, maybe not. Um, so I don't know if you guys are Barbara King solver, um, fans. I I'm a huge fan and, um, she has this book called animal vegetable miracle. Um, and she talks about, so she took her family to live on a farm, uh, for a year. I think they're still on the farm actually, but she wrote a book about being on the farm for a year and just eating whatever they grew. So they had to grow it or raise it in the case of like the Turkey for Thanksgiving, they had to grow it or raise it in order for them to eat it for the most part or buy locally. And she writes about how organic food companies or companies that, that have food that's organic, um, they'll technically follow the rules, but they'll do other things that are outside of the rules. So it's not like you're buying perfect food. And her advice was, if you're going to spend the money, buy local, um, because that's probably better in terms of how the food has been treated than necessarily going and buying organic. I don't know, um, if organic is better all the time, there are lists of things that you can look at in terms of fruit and what fruits you're better off buying organic. It's usually the ones with the thinner skin on it because fewer pesticides are used um, in the growing of the, of the food. That is generally universally true for organic food. Um, but again, if it, if it comes down, if it's a hardship to spend that money, I don't know that, that I would push to buy organic. Um, if it's something that it doesn't, it doesn't break the bank one way or the other, then sure go for the organic stuff. But if it's a, if it's a hardship and it's something that is, is financially challenging, I don't know that I would do it. Um, we have a question about your recommendations for eating out. Is it okay to cheat for a special occasion or is it better to stick to a loaded salad with more of a simple dressing? Um, what are your suggestions for that? Okay, cheating. Um, it's not cheating. It's enjoying yourself. It's having fun. Yes, I want everyone to do that. I want everyone to go out and have fun and not obsess over food and not obsess over this stuff, right? Because we're doing that too much and stress isn't good for us either. So if you're going to someone's birthday, don't think about it too much. Go to the birthday, go have fun and, and enjoy whatever you're eating. If you're like, okay, I'm going out, I want to be mindful, or I'm someone who, you know, I'm eating out two, three more times a week, because maybe you're a super busy person, maybe you don't like to cook. That's okay, right? We all don't have to love to cook. Um, but when you go, again, just try to eat as whole food based as you can. So if you're getting potatoes, get a big potato because you know, well, that's, it looks like a potato, it's a potato. Um, if you're getting chicken, get chicken that looks like chicken. If you're getting um, vegetables, get vegetables that look like vegetables. You mentioned a simple dressing, great. So if you're getting a salad, you know, just ask for oil and vinegar or lemon or whatever it is, because those dressings that you get, even in a nice restaurant, probably have emulsifiers in them. So 
yeah, I mean, get, get things that you can see with your eyes, like, oh, I know what's in this because it looks like the food is actually supposed to look, um, as opposed to getting a mashed potato because you're like, I don't know what they put in there. Right. So as much as you can, um, try to get those whole foods, things that, well, I know what the ingredients are in this. If you can eating out can be challenging. If it's something you do a lot, if it's something you don't do a lot and you're going to celebrate, please celebrate, please have fun, please have the pizza, have whatever it is that you want to have and, and don't sweat it. Because if we're eating mostly whole foods, most of the time, our bodies can handle it. The issue is that our bodies aren't doing so well handling 60 to 70% ultra processed day in and day out, but it's not, you know, it, it unless again, you're suffering from a health condition where you have to avoid something, then go enjoy. It's a treat. We should have treats and, and have fun. Um, but just for, for a day to day, our habit should be as whole food based as possible. Um, we have a question about green powders used in smoothies and what your thoughts on those are. Oh, no, <laughs> no, no powders. Um, right. So, so these protein powders and green powders and all the powders, um, are so heavily processed and marketed. And it's really, it's like taking the junk ingredients and repackaging it and selling it at such an immense markup. Um, if you want to make your own smoothies at home with, you know, fruits and veggies and whatever you like, awesome, right? Go for it. Um, but if you're spending, you know, all this money, like 20, 30, $40 for these jars of powders, buy organic, <laughs> buy buy whatever, buy whatever whole foods. Um, but yeah, I, I think those are, are, um, are the current hot scam. Um, somebody was wondering if you could share some of your favorite slow cooker meals. Um, and if you have any recipes for them in your book. I do. I actually have um, 24 recipes in my book, some of which are mine, some of which were gifted to me by friends and family who are just awesome cooks. Um, so, so my go-to slow cooker recipe is because everyone's going to eat it in my house and it makes a ton. And then I don't have to cook for two or three days is a chili. Um, and, and it's so flexible, right? You can put anything you want in a chili. So we are not vegetarian in my house. Um, but I do try to limit the amount of red meat we eat, but for the chili, I tried to do it with ground turkey and my daughter's like, no mom, just no, like you need to use beef. So I'll do a pound of ground beef um, brown it up, cut up an onion, cut up a pepper, throw that into my slow cooker, um, with three different cans of beans. So whatever beans you like, right. Rinse them, throw them in a can of, um, crushed tomatoes, and then a bunch of spices, throw that in, close the slow cooker, set it for eight and a half hours, because that's how long I want to set. You can set it for six, you could set it for nine, like it's just, but that's how long I'm going to be out of the house, right? And then I'm going to come back from work and then it's going to be ready. And so I love that because I can make like a giant pot. It's good for two days, right? For my family, for as much as we eat. Um, if I have some crusty bread to serve with it, great, or make some potatoes or whatever, um, super easy. And, you know, salad, cut up some carrots, whatever it is. Um, so, so quick. So I love that one. All right, and to just finish off, what do you hope um, readers will take away from your book after reading? So I, what I want people to do is I wanna be able to, to love food again and to go back to our own food traditions or borrow from other cultures. I'm a big borrower, right? So I, I love to borrow from my library, but I also love to borrow from my friends who, you know, oh, you know how to make this thing, show me how to make this. And so it doesn't have to come from my culture, but it could come from other people's cultures and just wonderful whole foods, foods that just express love and family and enjoyment. And we have to get back to that because if we continue on the path we're continuing, it's not headed anywhere good. So if people are able to find the time in their lives and find the space 
um, in their brains to, to do this and to incorporate eating good natural food back into their lives. Um, that's the biggest gift you can give yourself. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dawn, for taking some time out of your day to speak with us. Um, you've provided so much great information. I know um, everyone is <laughs> um, very grateful that you were here um, to share. And so we hope um, to see you all at some of our other library programs. You can check our website um, for all of our upcoming programs for uh, next month. And thanks again, Dawn, so much for, for being here. Thank you. thank you so much. This was great. Bye.